Sure. Good morning, you all. Welcome to the multiple crisis at the US-Mexico border and what you can do about it. My name is Amanda Pinheiro. I'm with the Migration Initiative at the UCSB. And that's the first um, you know, of a series of talks that we hope to promote related to migration, immigrants, uh, state response, uh, how related to COVID-19 and immigrant resistance in this um, year. But I'd like to ask Professor John Park, our director too, to the welcomings, Professor Park. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm calling you from Santa Barbara. Uh, it's, my, um, it's my honor to invite and to welcome you to this event. And first of all, I'd like to thank Amanda. Uh, this was uh, Amanda's idea really, and she organized the entire thing and uh, contacted all of the panelists and she'll be doing the introductions for each of them. Uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge that um, the bulk of organization, the, the, the heavy lifting for this event, that was all Amanda. And I want to uh, thank her very much for putting this together uh, and then for inviting our panelists. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the Office of our uh, Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It's Belinda Robnett. Uh, she offered generous support for this event, uh, as did the Office of Equal Opportunity and Discrimination Prevention, just kind of a long title for uh, the Department of Asian American Studies, Department of History, uh, Chicano Studies, Fem Studies, uh, and the Walter Cap Center. They all offer generous support for this event, uh, and it's my pleasure to acknowledge and to thank them for that. Yeah, um, uh, as a panelist had said before the event, uh, the crisis at the southern border is an ongoing thing. Uh, it has been just a devastating uh, set of events uh, and so uh, jarring to witness um, that I think all of us who study migration, uh, immigration patterns, and things like it's, it's just um, one of the most complex and most important issues uh, that we can tend to. And I, I really am very grateful to have these panelists uh, to help us understand this issue uh, on a deeper level. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Um, please, I would invite you to look at our website at the Migration Initiative at ECSB, uh, because we will be hosting more events like this one uh, to inform our campus community and the broader community about these issues. With that, I, Amanda, I think you should introduce our panelists. You should go. Thanks, Professor Park. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we have here uh, Professor Abigail Andrews. She's Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Mexican Migration Field Research Program at UC San Diego. She's the author of Undocumented Politics, Place, Gender, and the Pathways of Mexican Migrants, published in 2018 by the University of California Press. Her research focuses on gender, migration, and political sociology, particularly in Mexico, Central America, and the United States. She brings a global feminist lenses to her work, and she's committed to community-engaged teaching uh, for um, immigrants and climate justice. Dr. Andrews is currently working on a book on deportees called Banished Men, and she runs several community action research projects on asylum seekers at the UC San Diego border. Thanks so much, Professor uh, Andrews, for being here. Um, Kate Morrissey is a journalist and reporter of the San Diego Union Tribune. She, um, where she covers a wide range of immigration topics, including asylum, immigration, court cases, deportation, immigration detention, and more. She was the lead reporter on Return, a four-part investigation into the US asylum system published this year. You can find this uh, article and the series actually in the Migration Initiative website, um, left side column in the bottom. Uh, Professor Jessica Ordais, she's assistant professor of ethics studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, she's the author of The Shadow of El Centro, A History of Migrant Incarceration and Solidarity that just came out this March, right? Um, by the University of North Carolina Press, part of the series in Justice, Power and Politics. Her research focuses on Latinx, um, Chicanx history, US-Mexico border studies, radical social movements, migration and migrant politics, labor history, the carceral state, the detention and deportation regime, and food justice. 
and Nicole Ramos, who is an uh, immigration lawyer based in Tijuana and the director of a Otro Lado's um, it's an organization that works with migrants in the border, um, border rights projects that provides legal support to asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border. The project also engages in human rights uh, monitoring, uh, impact litigation, and advocacy efforts to challenge the systematic human rights violations. Nicole is also adjunct, um, adjunct professor at the Temple University. Um, uh, Nicole, am I pronounced right? Uh, Beasley School of Law and lectures extensively at universities, law schools, and professional conferences in the United States and Mexico regarding the impact of border enforcement practice, practice and policies on asylum seeker. So thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, I would like to pose an initial question for all of you and please um, feel free to, uh, to organize how you want to speak, but I heard that Nicole could start uh, this conversation with us. So we have heard, um, we read, we, we hear about the crisis at the border, right? We hear a lot the word crisis, but I'd like to, to ask you all to just um, talk a little bit more about uh, What's the crisis about? Are we talking about only one crisis? Are we talking about several, multiple crises intersecting at the same time? Um, and also the fact that even if we are hearing more about that in the last years and probably last months, it's not a new, it's not a, a new issue, right? Can we um, then start the conversation talking about what do we understand about crisis? What is really going on? And um, when do we go from there? Sure. Um, as Professor Park pointed out, the crisis is, is a continuum. And at this moment, the crisis is Title 42, which President Trump put into place at the start of the pandemic. It is a law that closes the border to asylum seekers um, who try to present themselves. They're turned away at the port of entry. If they try to enter in between ports of entry, they're simply expelled within a few hours back to Mexico. And in the cases of certain countries like Haiti and Cameroon and Nicaragua, they are deported back to their, they're not even deported, they're expelled back to their country of origin without ever having the opportunity to speak to an asylum officer. And that's a huge difference and a huge shift in, in how we've dealt with asylum seekers in recent years. And as a result of Title 42, what we see is this dramatic increase in kidnapping of migrants by very organized criminal cells, human trafficking, people who are the victim of anti-immigrant crime, either by regular residents in border cities, but also by Mexican law enforcement and Mexican immigration, um, all because they simply have nowhere to go. There's, just, it's, there's no valve to release the pressure. Um, and what makes this part of a continuum is, is, is we don't get to Title 42 without some other very important stepping stone policies. Um, beginning in the Obama administration in 2014, we saw a mass migration uh, from Central America, many unaccompanied children, many um, families with young children trying to seek asylum in the United States. And the response of the Obama administration was to lock up all these families, put them in rural detention centers where there's not access to attorneys. Um, the attorneys that do show up to represent them make access as difficult and as possible and deport people as quickly as possible. And if you believe that it is acceptable to incarcerate a mother and a two-year-old child in an incarcerative setting, then it's not that far off that we get to policies like family separation, right? Because it's impossible to incarcerate a parent and an infant if you view them as the same kind of human as you view your other family. And if you don't view people as human, then it's much easier to do things like forcible family separation, which we saw under the Trump policy. Going back to the Obama administration, we saw the, the rollout of what we now refer to as the metering policy or the wait list. Um, under the Obama administration, they came up with this wait list, which prevented asylum seekers from immediately accessing the port of entry 
And instead of having to get a number uh, on a list in a Mexican border city often run by, by Mexican immigration officials. And we did that initially as a response to the Haitian exodus that came in the spring and summer of 2016, where you had tens of thousands of Haitians coming to the border seeking refuge. And what's really dramatic for me about that, having years now to, to think about that, is President Obama was our first Black president. It's something that the United States is incredibly proud of as, as, as a symbol that we have somehow moved into a post-racial society. And yet, the administration of our first Black president came up with a policy designed to keep out thousands and thousands of Black immigrants, which really shows us that uh, the racism in our society is really deeply ingrained in our institutions. And we had the metering policy, which led to Trump's policy of Remain in Mexico, also known as MPP, which kept asylum seekers waiting in Mexico for even longer beyond their wait list time. Now, moving into a year and two years that people are stuck in Mexico. And so Title 42 is really just the, the, the end tip of that continuum, where now the door is permanently closed and anyone who even breaches that door is just going to be expelled either to Mexico or to or to another country. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Kate, how do you feel about um, joining us in this conversation? Sure. So um, as a journalist, I've tried to be very careful with the word crisis. I think it's been tossed around a lot in um, ways that don't make it clear who the crisis is happening to, um, because in, in so much of the phrasing, it sounds like the crisis is something that's happening to people in the United States, and I don't think that that's accurate. Um, the, the people who are in crisis in this moment are the people who have fled um, horrific things in their homes and have been forced to try to find protection in our country. And so the, you know, as, as Nicole was talking about all of these policies that have been put in place to try to keep them from accessing that protection or keep them from accessing the system that might give them that for protection further down the road. Um, I think that's, that's really where the idea of crisis is centered because crisis is a really um, powerful word when you when you think about what what conditions have to exist in order for something to actually be a crisis. Um, when you're looking at what's going on for people on the US side of the border, there are organizations who work to help asylum seekers or, or migrants get to their final destination. You know, we have organizations here in San Diego who receive them into a, a shelter type situation and then and then help them um, to their destinations and those those have grown up in response to some of the um, absence of, of federal government doing that work um, i think it's important to say but uh, and and then of course you have you know the federal government workers who who interact with with asylum seekers as they as they come to the border but those those folks are not in crisis right those folks have a lot of work to do but i don't i, I don't think that's the right word and i and i think that's getting mischaracterized a lot and so um, I guess I'm really sort of hesitant to, to, to throw that word around or, or to use that word excessively in talking about the situation because I think that's how it gets received. Um, and so I think for, you know, in terms of what's going on, like we have a huge history of, of trying to keep asylum seekers out of our country, trying to keep migrants out of our country, whether they are from you know, our neighbors or whether they are from places that are far away. And, and that goes back to even before we had an official asylum system, when you're talking about um, people fleeing the horrors of the Holocaust and getting turned back and then dying in the Holocaust, right? Like you have, you have that history of our country and we've never entirely gotten away from that. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, that, that came up in the project that I worked on last year returned is it, even when we created the asylum system in 1980, like we never really solved for that um, tendency of ours to try to deter people or push people away. And that is the, the pervasive line of US history in the way that we choose, choose to respond to people coming to our country. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, Dr. Andrews, 
Yeah, thank you for this question. It's a very complex and difficult question to answer. And I think Kate is right to ask the question of sort of, <laughs> is this a crisis and for whom? Um, because I think that um, uh, it, it can feed into this, the anti-immigrant hysteria that is driving the policies creating the crisis for migrants. Um, and I, I see um, a few different crises for migrants. One is just the dramatic um, expansion of organized criminal violence and state violence in Central America, as well as around the world, overlapping with climate crisis. Um, and that is driving people to have family members murdered and feel they literally cannot live in Central America. And you don't, you know, people are not sending their ch minor children <laughs> alone to the United States unless they think their minor children are going to die. Um, the second crisis is that um, these folks are forced to stay in Mexico. Um, and the third crisis is that in Mexico, there are conditions of starvation and serious violence. So we actually worked collaboratively with Al Otro Lado this winter with Nicole. Um, to do some surveys and interviews. And of the people that we interviewed, about 60% didn't have enough food this week. 90% were worried that they wouldn't have enough food within the coming month. Um, and 92% had been um, victims of violence while in Mexico. Um, interestingly, about a third of those were um, perpetrated to their knowledge by criminal groups. But importantly, about a third were perpetrated by Mexican state authorities. So I think we have to bring out that this isn't just organized crime targeting migrants, it's also the state itself targeting migrants. Um, and, um, you know, Amanda, you said, how have, how have the political, and let me add, um, I think there's this rhetoric in the media sometimes, some media, <laughs> not the good ones like Kate, um, that this is a new set of people arriving or a new process. Um, and some of my colleagues research, research suggests that there are seasonal flows of people when it's not too hot to cross into the United States and it's not too cold. Um, and that there is some pent up demand due to COVID. Um, you know, and so, so it's, it's a big question mark whether there's more people arriving right now this year than there ever have been or not. Um, but I wanted to bring up is sort of, Amanda, you framed this as how have the political responses to these crises worsened the situation? And I think that's sort of a misframing of the situation. The political, the politics of the US have created this situation. That it's not a response, right? <laughs> um, and, and they've done that in many ways. Um, one is the longstanding policy of prevention through deterrence, essentially militarizing the border and um, more or less shutting down unauthorized border crossing um, and making it extremely risky. Um, and then forcing people to stay in Mexico through various tactics. Um, so um, radically reducing the uh, grounds for asylum as well as the number of refugees granted asylum. Um, Obviously, the Remain in Mexico program, which is now being dismantled, but has created a serious um, crisis and pile up of people. Title 42, as Nicole mentioned, um, and militarization throughout Mexico. So some of this Mexican state violence is supported by the United States in trying to block people from getting to the United States. Um, so, uh, And let me just add um, another piece of this is the violence of US detention, because in our work with folks in detention facilities, an astonishing number are experiencing physical and verbal abuse while in detention. Um, and, um, you know, the, the just the sort of overlapping spaces of violence, all of which. Um, you know, involve the US state on various levels. And I say that even about organized crime in the sense that um, if you trace organized crime in Central America and Mexico back to its roots, you're gonna see that early initiators of organized criminal groups were often trained by the US military, um, such as in the case of the um, 
folks who worked with the military in El Salvador in the Civil War, as well as um, criminal groups like the Setas, who've now evolved into others in Mexico. Um, and um, likewise, the US, of course, uh, has deportation regime has further fueled the insecurity in um, the region and so on. So anyway, all of this is sort of these imbricated layers of violence and terror in which migrants are living. Um, and, uh, and I think the policies create that sort of on various historical and contemporary levels. Um, and today, even um, once Biden conceded and quote unquote expanded the refugee numbers, that's less than it had been historically um, you know, in the past. So there's been this sort of long-term systematic dismantling of the, of the space for, for refugees to even enter the US. Uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, th I think that came out kind of jumbled because it is jumbled. Let me just add that. Thanks, Dr. Andrews. I think um, I would like to just go back to what you mentioned about the violence of the U.S. detention and bring in uh, Dr. Dice, uh, who have uh, who has been working on that, and um, and invite you to please join this dialogue. Yes, thank you, Amanda. So I want to be really clear that the crisis I see is one rooted in a very long history and lineage of U.S. imperialism state violence and immigration enforcement. Recently, this has included a continuation of anti-migrant violence, family separation, child abductions, border policing, the increased incarceration of migrants, the sexual and reproductive abuse of migrants, and rhetorics and policies that frame them as criminal. And so from my perspective, the crisis is the policing and surveillance of migrants, the militarization of the border, like um, Abigail just mentioned, the sexual and reproductive abuse uh, um, and trauma inflicted on children and adults, border patrol violence, migrant apprehension, incarceration, deportation, and death um, to get at your question about COVID, um, which I'm not sure if we wanna go there next, uh, but that, that is how I view a crisis if there is one. Uh, we do have a few more minutes before we move on to the more specific questions. So I'd like to invite you all, um, you know, if you want to add something to that and possibly addressing the how the pandemic uh, has, you know, really added to the this intersection, right? This multiple crisis that uh, is happening in the border now. Nicole, uh, since you are in Tijuana and I know that you are really working on the ground, could you uh, add something on that? Uh, what we have seen that? What's been probably the most fascinating and horrifying to come out of the pandemic and, and Title 42 is the number of US citizen infants that are being expelled by CBP. Uh, that situation unfolds at, when a mother pregnant crosses the border, understandably the stress of, of crossing the border, um, we'll put that mother sometimes into labor. She'll be transported to a U.S. hospital uh, where she will give birth. And then after she's medically cleared for discharge, CBP will expel the mother and the infant to Mexico, regardless of whether the mother is a Mexican citizen, regardless of whether they speak Spanish, um, regardless of whether they have any money or a phone, there's no safety plan put in place. They're literally just dumped on the street. And we've had instances where the mother had no resources and had to sleep on the street with her infant for days until um, she was able to find some help. And most critically is they do this without them having the opportunity to secure an official birth certificate for the infant. So it's literally putting infants in a position of un being undocumented or stateless in, in Mexico. And so the mom has two options. Um, she can buy a Mexican birth certificate on the black market so she can have something to register that child um, in public health system and maybe later on public school um, or, or not. Uh, and so Obviously, early childhood vaccines are really important, um, especially when you're living in conditions like shelters and um, you know people have 
all sorts of things going around um, because everyone has just been traveling and they're sick. And so it's really putting these infants in a life or death situation. And, you know, I've had conservative critics approach me and talk about, well, they could just get a birth certificate. You know, everyone, everyone loses their birth certificate. You could just get a birth certificate, but there's some really important hurdles that people forget about. Um, you need to be able to download the birth certificate offline. You need to have access to the internet. If you don't have that in your home and a printer, you have to pay for that. You have to be able to read an application in English. You have to be able to pay the $50 uh, or more that it would take to notarize it by a US notary in a border city. Um, you have to pay for the international mailing fees. Um, for it to get to, to where it needs to go. And you need to have an address at which to receive it and possibly pay international mailing fees if you don't have a US address, someone in the US to receive it for you. Um, and so that's assuming a lot. And it really leaves people in a position where they don't have birth certificates for infants. Um, and um, it really, the pandemic has showed us what US citizen lives we're really trying to protect and this, you know, ever restrictive definition of who should be U.S. citizens. You know, and we've seen this movement grow, um, especially um, under the Trump administration, to either denaturalize people or to, you know, say that people just because they're born on U.S. soil should not be U.S. citizens. Um, and and that's where we're going with this. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Dr. Andrews, um, I know we are working remotely these last quarters, but I know that your research uh, keeps going, right? Um, have you, uh, what have you seen, heard about how COVID has made the situation even more complicated, especially for migrants? I mean, I think as we see in um, low income frontline US communities, COVID has exacerbated um, crises of basic needs, right? So uh, of course, the vast majority of migrants in Tijuana have no sources of income and have um, very acute basic needs. Um, and COVID just makes that a lot worse because for instance, people who might've picked up day labor here or there have not been able to. Um, some sources of um, food and other donations have been reduced. Um, so there is just that sort of basic need situation. Uh, at the same time, I think the US government both under Trump and under Biden has um, kind of used COVID as an excuse to just kind of cut off refugee admissions and cut off the entire process um, altogether. And we see that opening a little bit right now, but um, you know, that obviously the entire immigration system ground to a halt for much of the last year, meaning that the process of everybody's case being processed, processed also ground to a halt and their time stuck in a very vulnerable and violent situation extended, um, meaning more time to be on the streets without a home, more time to be um, exposed to kidnapping, violence, assault, rape. Um, so, so it just expands the sort of possibility for these, all of these things to happen. Um, and it just keeps people in a situation. I, I just want to add sort of psychologically, of course, most people coming to the U.S.-Mexico border have survived serious trauma. Um, and the uncertainty, um, and there are these, this violence they can experience at the border. And on top of that, um, the uncertainty and the inability to establish themselves um, sort of reinforce that trauma and are very painful and difficult psychologically. And a lot of people have talked to us about that. Yes. Um, Dr. Dice or Kate, you'd like to add something about uh, specific COVID before we move to our more specific questions. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of detention specifically, the pandemic has increased threats to migrants in immigration custody. So 
for forever, this is what I argue in, in my recently published book, detention centers have been death traps for migrants. And this has only resulted in one other challenge. Um, a lot of migrants have compromised immune systems in detention that you know deteriorate because conditions are awful, uh, inadequate medical technologies, medical neglect, poor record management, et cetera, has resulted in um, these horrendous conditions and then you get, you know, COVID. And so it, it's resulted in death. One of the first deaths was um, Carlos Ernesto Mejia, who fortunately passed away um, May of 2020 from COVID in ICE custody at the age of 57. And so it's just added the um, ways one could die while incarcerated. Um, I would like to tell our um, attendees, thanks, Dr. Das, um, that we're going to open for a QA around 1140. But if you have questions, you can just you know, uh, type them in the QA uh, tool that you have access. And um, we're going to bring the questions as we speak. Is that OK? Um, and Professor Park, would you help me to manage you know, the questions, uh, please? Um, I would like to move on. Um, and start talking more specifically about some themes with all of you. Um, and I was thinking about starting with Nicole. Nicole, um, I watched a video in which you were uh, talking about the risks uh, uh, and how difficult it is to be a lawyer, uh, immigrant lawyer, um, immigration lawyer, I'm sorry, um, in the border right now. Can you talk more about you know, the risks, uh, the rewards of working as an immigrant uh, lawyer, immigration lawyer uh, at the border. And the second question that I would like you to please um, talk to us about is about the relationship academia and organizations like um, lado that works with migrants. Um, how can you work together? Uh, how, how does this relationship take place? Uh, what's your experience? Um, could you tell more about this opportunities to engage academia and organizations? Sure. Um, well, the I'll start with the rewards. The reward is just knowing when somebody gets that call after they get over to the US and they call you and they say, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm safe and it's such a sigh of relief, the change of their whole demeanor changes. And so um, I stay in touch with a lot of my clients um, and just to constantly just get these mundane photos, like they're at the laundromat, they're at the park, they're going to school, they're going to work and just being able to enjoy just a regular peaceful life. Um, that is my greatest joy for my clients to go on and have incredibly boring American lives. Um, and I guess the risks or the things that make it more challenging, um, aside from, you know, border cities or anywhere in the world, not just Mexico, but border cities tend to be more, more dangerous because organized crime tends to move things across borders. Um, what's been most frustrating for me is the retaliation and the harassment by my own government in collaboration with the Mexican government in terms of putting myself and my co-directors on a binational watch list, to, um, putting migratory alerts in my co-directors passports such that they would be deported from Mexico, revoking my global entry, creating a dossier on me with my mother's like address, you know, she's a school teacher, kind of freaked her out. Um, and basically just, you know, surveilling me and, and, and harassing my staff. That's that criminalization has been incredibly frustrating because myself, my colleagues across the border have been doing nothing but trying to literally uphold the rule of law while politicians in DC do everything in their power to break what we understand to be the rule of law. And the complicity in the Mexican government and the talking out of both sides of the mouth is also really frustrating. It's kind of like being in an abusive relationship where you're constantly being gaslit. Um, and this also leads into you have nationalist movements on both the Mexico side of the border and the US side of the border, Mexico first, America first, that feed off the criminalization of the governments and, and, in, and in turn mount defamation campaigns, harass us in our office um, or outside our office in the port of entry. Um, and, and that's just 
um, just incredibly frustrating. And I guess what uh, we've been doing in the last few years with academia um, and trying to meld the, the interests of students and professors with the needs of our clients is to you know, figure out what is the issue that needs to be studied on a practical level? Like, what are the questions that we have? And um, the project that we did with UCSD, we were really interested in understand what were the gaps in, in uh, that we were not able to necessarily fill with our own services. But so that way we, in conversations that we're having with funders and, uh, and other programs about gaps, we can speak intelligently to that. Um, and so that's just one example of, of how we worked together. But the students in doing their, their research also volunteer with us. And so they're gaining skills and how to just have regular conversations that are not academic and applying a lot of the theory that they're learning about to these interactions that they're having that are really um, human um, and real. And it gives a lot of meaning to the research. And it, it, it makes, I think, students more inspired to do the work because they realize that these are real world issues. These are real people. And what they're going through really matters. And it's incumbent upon all of us to think about how we can best meet people's needs and best hold our government accountable and, and when our government doesn't want to be accountable, how to best create a safety net. Thank you. Um, since you, you answered this um, second question, um, I would like to just bring uh, Dr. Andrews because one of the questions that uh, we had for you was exactly about the engaged scholarship and then the work you have been doing, right? So for example, you are a an example of a scholar who really bridges academia and activism and migration, right? And, and gender studies and uh, immigrant advocacy. Um, why is it important to, uh, to, to cross academic borders, right? Um, and and to, uh, to invest in a more engaged scholarship? Um, that's the first question for you. Do you wanna go ahead? Uh, yeah. Um... So I, I suspect that most people on this call already think this is important. Um, I think the bigger challenge is how do you actually do it? Um, because I, from my experience, most people in sociology really care about social justice and that's why they study inequality and power and uh, violence and all of these topics. Um, I will admit that I have spent my whole life wanting to do um, work that what went beyond academia and wasn't just for the purposes of scholarly publishing, mostly unsuccessfully, um, <laughs> because uh, it's very difficult to build dynamic partnerships. Um, you, many organizations are so overwhelmed with the work that they have to do that you need leaders and individuals who both are willing to take the time to collaborate and are, are a little bit visionary. Um, and I would put Nicole in this category about how research can actually be useful to shape and design advocacy. Um, so that is the hard thing to find. Um, and as a scholar, for me, to be honest, before I got tenure, which is up until the past year, um, I felt an incredible amount of pressure to do scholarly publishing um, and that made it very difficult for me to prioritize applied work. Um, I've sort of flipped that since getting tenure and my priority is to do work that's going to be directly relevant to the communities that I'm working with. And if scholarly publishing comes out of that, great. <laughs> um, but I'm luck lucky enough to be in this very privileged position where I'm not gonna lose my job. Um, but I, I have colleagues who who have um, you know lost promotions and raises because they've done applied work, which is so backward, I think, in in the way of functioning of academia. Um, so I, I will also say, um, you know, the, uh, there are many challenges. I think many of which are obvious to people. So one of them is building really dynamic partnerships. Um, Another is just the different sort of structures and timelines of academia and advocacy. Um, advocacy works much quicker than academia. 
Um, so people are immediately responding to issues and situations and um, we like to take our time. <laughs> so being able to find projects that can meet somewhere in the middle is quite difficult. Um, and then, you know, there are issues like confidentiality, um, just the amount of time. Um, and I think a lot of academics want to do applied work, um, perhaps unintentionally end up in sort of a more extractive relationship where they're taking data, um, but it's not really clear what they're producing in return. Um, and I think this makes uh, advocates skeptical, rightfully so. Um, and I, I, in my experience, the way around this is to start from the beginning in collaboration with advocacy folks, right? You can't design something and then make it collaborative after the fact. Um, and, and it's difficult to do that unless you have a, a privileged status within academia. Um, so all of that to say, um, you know, I think this is very difficult. I don't think it's impossible. There are um, sort of grants and funds for this kind of work. Um, as Nicole said, it is an incredible boon for students um, just to be out in the real world doing something relevant. In fact, I will say the last year before I got tenure, as I mentioned, there were some constraints for me about doing this work. The students themselves came to me and said, we're doing this to publish scholarly publications. Why? What is the point of that? <laughs> um, and they, so they want to be doing work that matters to someone directly, immediately. And a lot of the students that I work with don't want to become professors. They want to go into law or um, some other kind of advocacy. So this gives them really direct experience in that while seeing how research is related. Um, so it's amazing for students. I think it's just hard for advocates the amount of management it takes to work with students um, because you know students are 20 years old and they've never done this before. <laughs> so there's a lot of training needed and a lot of oversight and all of that. Um, so all that to say, it's totally worth it on many angles. Um, it makes the work so much more meaningful. Um, you know, it makes our work actually relevant for social change. Um, we can build dynamic relationships and dialogues. It's great for students to learn on so many levels. Um, and there are a lot of barriers to doing it, but if anyone wants to talk more about sort of um, how to approach that, I, I'm happy to think through it. And I will just say this is a work in progress for me as well. Thank you. Um, let me just, you know, uh, go back to what you're saying about the, the theory and practice. Um, and I'd like to to ask you to talk a little bit more about uh, what uh, we have been reading and studying about the meaning of um, forced displacement. And I think your work, especially for someone who is on the ground, you know, and what you have experienced. So uh, in the scholarship, we have really, you know, um, listen to the call to rethink how we address, uh, how we define forced displacement, but especially based on your work um, with, you know, Mexico, uh, Mexican deportees and Central American asylum seekers. Um, what have you seen about the, the really meaning of forced displacement, especially uh, based on what you see in the US-Mexico border now? Yeah, I mean, I, when I saw this question, I was wondering what you were thinking of <laughs> the meaning of forced displacement. But maybe I can take a guess, and if I'm I'm not on on track, you can redirect me. Sure. Um, you know, I think the sort of traditional model of forced displacement is uh, civil war drives oppressed minority to flee country, or re politically repressive government um, drives people to flee. Right. So there's something sort of high level institutional going on. And that is how our refugee system is organized. Um, so it's not acknowledging all of these other um, forms of violence and so on, driving people to move. Right. Um, and I think so much of so many of our theories of migration are based on labor migration. Um, which is often thought of as voluntary, but of course, labor migration is not necessarily voluntary either. <laughs> um, people may be dying of hunger and they have to migrate to work to eat. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I will just specifically speak to my work on deportation. Um, 
obvious, I think it's obvious that deportation is forced displacement in which the US um, <laughs> violently removes people from their lives and moves them to a place that um, is unfamiliar to many. Um, so many of the deportees that I've worked with have not been to Mexico since they were young children, um, or they have not been for many years, they no longer have family there, um, the place that they were born is not a viable uh, place to live due to violence or poverty. Um, so uh, not only is this the US sort of actively removing people to a place that they don't intend to be, um, people also uh, have a very hard time returning to their home um, because in many cases that's not a vital place to be. So they're, they're relocating to some entirely new place. Um, so I really am thinking about banishment or deportation as um, sort of a, a forced removal or exile. I think a lot of people think about it that way in, within the social sciences, but probably not so much in the public. Um, and then we have to think about um, Central Americans and others coming to the US-Mexico border, um, fleeing violence that operates on very various scales, right? So um, intimate partner violence is very widespread among people at the US-Mexico border, um, religious persecution, political persecution, um, of course, organized crime, um, state impunity, so what you have is sort of a multi-sided, and of course, climate crisis um, sort of underlies many of these other situations. So you have this very multi-sided um, violence that's sort of hard to compute in the official framework of forced displacement, but that's driving people, um, that's forcing people to move on various levels. Right. Thank you. That was exactly what I had in mind, not only to, uh, to touch on uh, how the scholarship has changed about how we uh, understand, um, you know, forced displacement, but especially in the public, right, especially to touch on climate change, right, as a main uh, uh, factor behind that. Um, we have a few questions. Um, actually, one question, Professor Park, do you want to bring the question we have in the Q&A? Um, you want to say for later, what do you recommend? Let me unmute myself. And then uh, the question comes from uh, Mr. Castillo, uh, and it does relate to the pandemic and the ways in which the Trump administration used the pandemic in opportunistic ways. And it was about Title 42, right? And about how the, um, the Trump administration used a, a fairly obscure, older public health rule uh, to um, get CDC support in, in shutting down new admissions or, or any kind of refugee claims. Uh, I wonder if the panelists would like to speak to that particular issue uh, and especially explain more uh, about Title 42. I, I can speak to that. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, as you already mentioned, uh, Title 42 prevents asylum seeker processing both at the ports of entry and for asylum seekers that enter in between ports of entry, so through the hills or through the desert, um, so on and so forth. And it expels people either back to Mexico or if they're from places like Haiti, Cameroon, Nicaragua, it will expel them back to their countries of origin without the opportunity to speak with an asylum officer. There is a really small exemption in Title 42, which allows an asylum seeker to theoretically have an interview pursuant to the Convention Against Torture. Um, however, our experience is no matter what asylum seekers tell Border Patrol officers or CBP officers um, at the port, about how they're afraid to go back to Mexico or they're afraid to return to their home country. Very few are actually granted that interview. Um, and in, in many cases throughout the pandemic, I've received contact from, from clients that have just recently been detained and asking for help to signal to officials that they want to have some kind of interview. And they're not really, you know, they're not saying, hey, I, I'm in Title 42 and I wanna to go to Title 8. They're just wanting to talk to anyone. Um, and so the fact that um, there is a process which is theoretically in existence that gives people this opportunity to talk to someone, but 
officers are once again refusing to uphold not only federal law, but international law, one of the few treaties that we've actually ratified um, is just, it, I would say it was shocking if we didn't have this history of trying to keep as many people out as possible. Um, but yeah. I could add a little bit to that if you, if you like. Um... So one of the things that I think is important to um, talk about is that Title 42 was not just something of the Trump administration. It was created by them. It's been continued under Biden. And in some ways, it's actually been changed, um, changed under Biden such that people are being flown from parts of Texas where um, the Mexico side has said that, that certain families will not be able to be expelled there. Um, they're being flown to San Diego, for example, so that they can be expelled. So we're using government resources currently to, to put people on airplanes, to bring them the entire length of the border, to then expel them to a city that they do not know, that they've never been to, and that they have no support in. And that's something that, that started more recently under the Biden administration. So just to add um, that detail. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Professor Parker, we move on with some questions or we move on with our question here. What do you suggest? I think the other questions are broader. I think we can move on to the other yeah. questions. And All then, right. Um, we will have a QA and a around right, very soon. So. 1140, yeah, soon. All right, so hold your questions uh, for the Q&A, but if you need, um, you can also um, add them to the chat. I would like to bring Professor um, Yes, Jessica Ordaz, now to talk a little bit more about um, your book, right? And especially um, the history of the US uh, detention system from, um, I was uh, reading your book, from uh, detaining a few hundred people, right? To, to become, you know, um, the place where a few thousand unauthorized migrants um, are being kept and, and treated far from their families. Um, can you talk about the the transition? Sorry, let me place this question better. The the transition of the the function, the role of the U.S. detention system, right? Uh, especially in the last, let's say, um, 50, 60 years. Um, can you please um, give us some historical background and relate to how we see that today? Absolutely, yes. So I will answer your question about rise and transformation in terms of numbers in a second, but you did mention function as well, which is ultimately the question I'm more interested in. Um, and so throughout the book, I do talk about the inherent um, purpose, intentional um, violence that detention serves to be instructive, to be punitive, and it always has, at least the one that I write about, the El Centro Immigration Detention Facility, which was in operation from 1945 until 2014. And from the very beginning, um, I start by talking about how unauthorized Mexican migrant men were forced to construct their very place of incarceration and served as um, a system of forced labor. Um, and so that's all I'll say about that for now. But yes, from the very beginning, it was punitive and violent um, and had a lot to do with the extraction of labor. Um, but in terms of the rise and the transformation in terms of the carceral landscape that we have today in uh, 2021 and, you know, having over 200 facilities and centers that hold migrants, that really is a transformation that took place during the 1980s. So there were facilities before, especially, like I said, the El Centro one. So before the 1980s, most migrants were either incarcerated in local jails or INS detention facilities, such as the one in El Centro or ones in El Paso and Port Isabel or Miami. But there were only a handful and they were mostly along the border. Um, this changed in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. In 1982, there's uh, a a mandatory law that is passed um, that specifically states that political asylum applicants must wait in detention while um, 
at the same time as we know the Reagan administration reduced the number of people who were granted asylum. And so more people then become detainable and deportable with these transformations in the 1980s. But in addition to that, in terms of the infrastructure for detention and deportation, the federal government, Congress specifically allocates millions and millions of dollars so that the INS can construct new facilities and prioritize detention. Um, and so that is uh, a very important moment in a shift in there was always a priority of detention, but then the government actually had the facilities to be able to detain and then deport folks. Thank you. Yes. Um, and now I have a question that's a very, you know, a uh, question in a topic that I'm very much interested. Um, can you talk more about, you know, how these detaining migrants have worked together to create transnational solidarities and innovative forms of resistance. And I think uh, maybe I would like to invite um, the other panelists to jump in uh, because I'm pretty sure that, especially for those who work on the ground, you have seen new forms of resistance, right? New forms of transnational solidarity. So maybe uh, Dr. Ordais could give us, you know, uh, the historical and also what you got in your research and the other ones could jump with some more, you know, current uh, examples that we have seen. Yes. So in my research, I found that migrants, as long as they've been incarcerated, have resisted. It's just looked differently. So in the 1940s, when the El Centro immigration facility first became operational, it often looked um, it, the, the example that I write about is escaping, fleeing, running away. So because the detention and deportation regime was not what it is now, right? Even the very fence was a bit more um, malleable and they could easily crawl under the fence or jump over the fence. Escape, runaways, fleeing was the primary method in which folks literally escaped uh, their incarceration. But then by the 1980s, when the demographics of folks who are in detention shifts, right? So in El Centro, it was from the very beginning, INS officials designed it as a place to hold unauthorized Mexican migrant men. The shifts in the 1980s to really hold Central American um, asylum seekers in addition to uh, Mexican migrants. And so with that, uh, folks who are incarcerated there really organize and work together and protest via hunger strikes. So the hunger strike becomes the number one way in which folks protest their incarceration. And I write about one in particular that occurred in 1985. Uh, and we can see these hunger strikes still today, which yes, I'd love to hear from the other panelists their thoughts. But for me, that was one of the really hard parts of writing this book was that their grievances are exactly the same as they are in 2021. And so very little has changed. If anything, things have gotten worse. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I don't know if Kate and Nicole probably have more sort of direct observations or thoughts about this, but um, I, I guess what's been most striking to me in the past few years of our work with asylum seekers in Tijuana has been um, this notion of resiste gozando, so sort of resisting through joy. Um, and I think it's one of the most inspiring things about working with people in just such sort of dire situations has been to sort of see the forms of love and resilience and creativity that people are able to practice and sort of use as a source of grounding in a situation of a lot of violence and instability. And this is not to say sort of everybody is even sort of in a position to be able to do this, but um, some of the organizations that we've worked with um, have really tried to create space for music and creativity and art and dance. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I, I, I think, you know, perhaps that's on traditional notion of resistance, but in a situation where sort of everything is conspiring to make people suffer, um, I do think sort of claiming joy is, um, is a form of resistance and, and, and is really, really beautiful. And um, yeah, so I'll just add that. And of course, you know, sort of we, we see 
more organized forms of resistance too, but that, that's been one of the ones that's been most noteworthy to me in the context of, of people stuck in Tijuana. Um, I can jump in too. So I guess just from, from personal experience, the way that um, I see a lot of folks, for example, at the Otay Mesa Detention Center, which is the, the local one here in San Diego, um, resisting is, is somehow getting a hold of my phone number and calling me and saying like, I want to tell you what's going on in here. And then they pass the phone around to like 10 or 15 other people in their, in their pod. And they all, they all want to tell about what's happening inside and, and the bravery of doing that, knowing that, you know, they might face retaliation. They might um, be, you know, expo in, in, in some cases choosing to use their names because they know that it gives what they're saying more, more, um, power, knowing that that, you know, puts a target on them, whether that's retaliation, whether that's something that could be brought up in their in their immigration court case later, you know, and that's, that's, you know, their choice, I would never pressure somebody to, um, to put their name, name on statements like that, but, um, but they choose to. Um, and I think, you know, especially last year, during the pandemic, um, sort of coming back to that conversation a little bit, um, Otai had a really, really serious outbreak um, in April and May uh, going and going into the summer last year. Um, for a long time, we had the highest number of COVID positive cases of any ICE detention facility nationwide. Um, and I had people calling me every single day to tell me about it. Um, when they finally were offered masks, but were told they had to sign contracts that um, had a hold harmless clause for um, the private prison company that runs Otai. Um, and some of the women refused to sign and, and you know, ended up escalating into a situation where they were threatened with pepper spray. And, and some said they were even actually pepper sprayed. Um, you know, I was, I was called immediately by some of the women in there to, to tell me that that had happened so that the public could be made aware that that had happened. Um, and I think that's, at least, you know, as, as a journalist, that's, that's the way that, that um, the resistance sort of interacts with me <laughs> um, is, is people choosing, choosing to come forward and, and choosing to tell those stories, choosing to talk about their hunger strikes and while they're going on them. Um, and even, you know, I even get letters from people. I remember several years ago, I got a letter from a group of black detainees who were mostly from African countries, also a couple of Caribbean countries um, calling out the racism that they were experiencing, and, and they had they decided they were going to come together as a group and write a letter that they they wanted to be made public. Um, and so I wrote you know wrote about that a couple of years ago. Thank you. I, I just wanted to share an anecdote, which is that Kate that Kate had told me, if it's okay with you, that um, sort of early on in the pandemic there were a lot of crises, crises in Otai Mesa Detention Center, but they weren't allowing visitors to come in. So Kate went and sort of stood outside with a giant sign saying, "I'm a journalist. Here's my number. Call me." Um, and sort of even the gumption to be able to see that out the window and call is pretty impressive. Um, it's just kind of a nice little little picture. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Nicole, do you have any um, thoughts on, on the, the forms, new forms of resistance before I go back to Kate? Because I really want to hear more about, you know, her role as a reporter. But Nicole, uh, especially for you who are in, in TJ now, uh, in Tijuana now, uh, what have you seen in terms of forms of resistance, um, especially, you know, um, I'm really interested more, not only uh, deportees, but also uh, forms of resistance um, from migrants from all over the world that are in Tijuana, right? I, I, in my research, I talk about Tijuana as this global waiting room when you have migrants from several parts of the world. And I'm really interested in, in here what you have um, about forms of resistance and how their own culture, different um, you know, approach to resistance, how it shapes how they navigate, um, you know, the state violence and other forms of violence at the border? I think um, a good example of this would be a coalition that began late last year in response to the pandemic across several border cities, the Defend Asylum Coalition, um, in some cities it's called Save Asylum, 
And um, in Tijuana, it's a collaboration between different organizations on San Diego and, and the Tijuana side. But what has been most fascinating about that coalition is all of the migrant participants there um, that have really shaped the media narrative. Um, when Biden was elected as a coalition, we thought it would be important to release a statement or have a press conference. Um, and we were really intentional about that press conference and that statement coming struck directly from migrants that had not come filtered. And the press conference, um, which we used our organizational platforms in order to invite press and have all the, you know, the Zoom bells and whistles was entirely run by migrants. So really in removing the talking head of the lawyer or somebody else filtering what that message is. And we also um, were able to produce some videos where people got to tell not as so much about what they were fleeing um, because, I, you know, most people are fleeing something pretty terrible. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here trying to survive these impossible conditions, but just about how dehumanizing the process is um, and how they understand, even though they may not know the intricacies of U.S. law, that this is a violation of their rights, right? Um, and lots of people have seen those, those videos um, and seen those written materials that they've put out. And the comment that I always get, which is so, so strange to me, like, oh, it's, they're so well-spoken. Oh, wow, they have such a unified message. And it's just kind of this, it, it, it's amazing to me how much people infantilize immigrants coming to the, you know, just because they don't, some of them don't speak English, like they don't know what's happening, like the news does not get translated and disseminated throughout the world or, or other people just don't read outside of the borders. And um, I feel like, you know, for me, that's been that seeing that that message building and that platforming really rise up has been one of the most joyful parts about this. Um, because if we think that migrants need saving after they got here and survived, you know, God knows what, um, lots of things that none of us could survive. And, you know, really, we, we, we should give them a lot more credit. And so it's great to see that narrative at least shifting at this, at this part of the border. Thank you. Uh, let me just go back to Dr. Ordaz. Um, and just to ask you to, can we say, would you say, especially the hunger strike, uh, you know, in the context of what Nicole just said, um, are we talking about uh, political mobilization? Are we talking about immigrant forms of mobilization? And uh, what have you, you know, found in your research that would relate to these, um, these forms of resistance, but in a more organized way? Yeah, so I actually talk about the hunger strikes in the 1980s as forms of transnational migrant politics because uh, a lot of what Nicole actually just mentioned came up in the same strike in 1985, where INS officials actually tried to blame one of the lawyers by the name of Graciela Zavala. And we're like, oh, <laughs> clearly she's the one that organized this hunger strike as if the incarcerated migrants weren't the ones experiencing this level of violence and trauma. And so I do talk about it as a transnational forms of resistance because in interviewing um, some of them, as well as the lawyer, I, you know, it was very clear to me that they were bringing these long histories and lineages of their own activism, many of them literally like were guerrilleros, right, in, in Central America, and so it's just absurd to think that one, they, they need somebody else uh, to speak for them, but then also that they are not the ones experiencing this violence and therefore wanting to protest and, and get the word out there. Um, and so, yes, I, I do see it as a form of organized resistance. Um, just um, the role of the media uh, back in the 80s. Um, I'm gonna talk to Kate more about that, but I'd like to know if you got something in your research about the role of the media. Talk about the, the role of the lawyer, right? Uh, the immigrant mobilization, but what was the role of media? Uh, do you have anything related to that? I do, yeah. So if folks are interested, I definitely at least check out um, that chapter, which is also an article, if that's a shorter read for you all. Um, so it was fascinating because in speaking to the lawyer Graciela, who, who was around in at that time in 1985, she 
was so, so helpful. She had collected like her own archive and kept it for years and years until I went to talk to her and she was like, here you go, you know? And so there were newspapers, not only from the United States and San Diego specifically, but throughout Latin America and analyzing sort of how they were talking about the strike was radically different from the San Diego newspapers who were really much like highlighting the voices of the INS who said things to really de delegitimize the strikers um, by saying things like, oh, well, we found candy wrappers near the strike. So they didn't like, it's not a legitimate hunger strike. They're actually eating. And really, you know, they, there's quotes that I highlight saying things like, well, they're in a detention facility. They're not in a hotel. Like, what do they expect? Um, which is very different than some of the other newspapers from uh, Latin America that were just sort of reporting like this happened or that happened. Um, but the ones in San Diego definitely had a conservative bias. <laughs> which should maybe is not surprising. So Kate, that's a good moment for you to come in. Um, can you talk a little bit more, especially about um, your role, especially in shaping right public opinion uh, and um, immigrant sentiment, right, or how people uh, look at this crisis? Would you, would you talk a little bit more about uh, what you take into consideration when you are, you know, um, thinking about what to report, how to report, what to focus on. Uh, I would like to hear, you know, ethical, political, or sometimes even personal factors that you take into consideration when you go to, uh, you know, Otay Mesa detention and show them your phone number and say, hey, call me. And um, can you talk more about your process of, um, you know, production, news production? Sure, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I guess, you know, my role is, um, it's a little bit complicated because I'm not an advocate and I'm not, um, you know, my agenda is, is accuracy and truth and, and allowing people to share their stories. Um, I don't have a, um, or as a journalist, like I'm not supposed to think about my work as having like a political agenda or like trying to accomplish something other than I am informing people about what's going on. And so, and, and to do that as, as accurately as I can. Um, and so how to, how to do that is, um, you know, I mean, that's something that, that I think about every day. It's something that keeps me up at night as, as how to do that, you know, in a way that's respectful and in a way that's human and in a way that's, um, you know, as uh, nuanced as it can be. And, uh, you know, like, and to, to not cause harm with my work. Yeah. You know, I think that's, um, there are a lot of, you know, not, not to down, down talk my entire industry, but there are a lot of journalists out there who I think are more concerned about getting a story than they are about the impact that the story might have on the people they're talking about. Um, and, you know, I know I'm not perfect and, and definitely like if there's feedback to be had on that, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. all ears and, and happy to try and do better, but that is, um, something that I worry about a lot is, is, am I telling a story in a way that, that increases or decreases the harm in the world? And, and so maybe that's, um, <laughs> if, if there's an agenda to be had, maybe that's it. Um, but I think, you know, as, as far as what stories I tell, it's, it's a combination of things that I hear from sources. And so a big part of my job is, is cultivating sources and, and following up with them and just picking, picking their brains about what's going on and what's keeping you up at night. That's probably one of my favorite questions to ask people when it's not like a breaking news situation. And it's like, hey, what's keeping you up at night? What's going on right now? Um, and then, you know, I'll get a list of story ideas that, you know, it'll take me six months to get through just from talking to a couple of people with, with how many things are going on. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's obviously breaking news. We'll hear from, from, you know, the federal government that this policy is changing. And so then I have to figure out, well, what does that mean? And, and what impact is that going to have? And is that something that uh, I need to explain to people? 
or is it something that's like not that big of a thing? So there's there's a, there's sometimes a large amount of reporting without a lot of writing, just trying to figure out you know what's going on and and what's the most relevant story to tell. Um, sometimes I do also get assigned stories. You know, there'll be something that is of particular interest to um, one of the higher ups at my news organization. They're like, oh, let's get some more stories on that. That sounds really, you know, like a thing we need to be covering closely. And, and that's, you know, part of my job is to, is to do that as well and to be in conversation so that that's not um, just something that's get mandated down to me, but that I'm also sort of, you know, saying, well, did you think about this or what about this other thing or what if we cover it this way? Um, I will say in the five, five-ish years that I've been um, at the organization that I'm at, those conversations have gotten a lot better and a lot easier than they were when I first started covering immigration at the paper. Um, and I'm really, you know, I think like any news institution, we have a long way to go in terms of what we're doing, but I am also um, proud of the, the steps that we're, of, of the path that we seem to be on right now. Um, it makes me feel good about where where we're at or where we're headed maybe is the better thing to say um and then you know in terms of of what i what i try to do when i'm telling a story is to really as much as i can center the people who are who are affected and, and sometimes it's difficult because you know, people are afraid to have their names or their, their faces published. And so then I have to navigate that or people are afraid to talk to me, period, because uh, not all journalists are the, you know, the greatest at, at interacting with communities. And historically, there's been a lot of damage done, um, particularly when you're talking with, um, with folks in, in immigrant communities or, or people who are are migrating a lot of times um, in the countries that they're fleeing the press is you know uh, another arm of an oppressive regime and so you know there's a lot of fears on multiple levels in talking to me and so navigating that and figuring out how to best tell a story can sometimes be very complicated um, and so sometimes that is why you'll see you know, the advocate speaking on behalf of the person because the person is too afraid to, to be centered in that way, but, but um, always doing the, the best that I can to try and, and get to like, what is the actual experience? What is the actual impact of, of what's happening? That's a very long way to answer your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. We ended up answering my second question. And <laughs> with that, I think I'm gonna just open for our Q&A &A and ask Professor Park to help me out with uh, the questions. And I'd like to invite you all to jump in and answer the questions we have for you. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the panelists for your insights. I just think this, this is, uh, this is an, uh, such a compelling area of public law and, and Thank you very much for your participation in this panel. Um, I saw that the first question, uh, Professor Andrews has already volunteered to start, but the, the question itself was about uh, practical actions. Uh, many of the, the people in our audience are, uh, they're not necessarily working in this as professionals now, but uh, the question is about what are some practical actions we can take in order to be more impactful uh, in helping out in this crisis? And uh, what organizations might you um, recommend that we can donate to and specific bills that we can support? Right. So Professor Andrews, I think you wanted to answer that. Yeah, question. I mean, I'll just say briefly, I think others will have more to add. Um, Aldo Prolado is doing really important heroic work at the border with asylum seekers, both directly re representing them legally as well as advocating for them. Um, and uh, donations always really help. Um, I put in a link in the chat uh, in the drop down list, you can choose different projects, but the one we've been working on is the one that addresses basic needs, um, which is the Migrant Solidarity Fund. And then I also put in um, links and the names of two other organizations that um, are really wonderful that we've been working with that also work with asylum seekers. Thank you. Did any of the other panelists want to reply to that particular question? Yeah, I can share a few things. So in the immediate um, moment, I think 
there's a lot of uh, importance in visiting folks who are, are detained, right? Like it's very isolating, like all incarcerated spaces. And there are lots of visitor programs where you can um, meet people who are in detention and have weekly conversations with them. So in terms of detention, I think that's important in like the immediate moment. However, I'll be transparent. And it's obvious in my book that I <laughs> I'm personally an abolitionist when, it, when I think about detention centers in the carceral state. And so I always like to mention the abolish ICE movement personally. Um, but I know that that's sort of thinking future. <laughs> so that's what I'll share. I think that's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, hey, colleagues, uh, we're winding down. So, you know, um, we have about 10 minutes left. But let's just think out loud. I mean, I just think uh, I come to this as a legal historian, right? Uh, I'm a recovering attorney, uh, but most of my life is as a as a legal historian. It's just amazing to me that um, white folks arrive in California, Texas, Arizona, very short time ago. I mean, <laughs> it hasn't been that long, uh, and yet they're imposing a uh, white political majority still insist on these hard boundaries. Uh, to the point where they're perverting their own legal principle in the sense that um, when you're an asylum seeker, uh, it's just so inappropriate to treat people like that as wrongdoers, right? And then to have them try to prove that they're not. I mean, it's just such a, a weird way of thinking about migration. And it's just uh, criminalizing people just for migrating. And I just think that that... Uh, yeah, for many of our students, and especially for younger people on the call, uh, I would recommend um, a deeper look at the history of what the borderlands look like, right? And just to be able to see that this is just really a very troublesome and unlawful way of governing that particular area. Okay, so that's my take. <laughs> so. Um, do we have another question? Uh, that yes, yes, we do have another question. Uh, uh, can the panelists? You know, all social science research shows movements matter, so I wouldn't dismiss yeah. the movement to abolish ICE. Um, yeah, absolutely. That would lay the groundwork for social change. So, um, yeah, don't don't think too lowly of, of <laughs> political activism. We did have another question. So can the panelists please speak on the trends they see in regard to the rate of successful asylum claims for unaccompanied migrant children? Uh, and what are the most common grounds under which these cases have been granted? I think it's a more practical question. Yeah. Nicole? Sure. Um, I mean, I think I'll probably speak just a little bit more generally on trends of success. Um, conservatives point to low asylum grant rates as proof that people are coming and they're not really asylum seekers and they're not really worthy of protection, but what, and that applies to adults and, and children alike. Um, but what people miss about this is that you know, the constitution gives us the right to counsel, but the immigration system does not provide any sort of public defender model for immigrants that are really uh, involved in proceedings defending their lives. Um, asylum law is a very complex area of law, even for immigration attorneys and judges. Uh, judges get it wrong all the time, and that's why they're very frequently getting reversed by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and so for us to expect people who are many, in many cases detained, in almost all cases have suffered some really se severe trauma. Um, and if they're not detained, they might be living in the US and just struggling to make ends meet. Um, to then make sense of our very complex US asylum system and to do so without the benefit of the attorney is really the same as us sending someone into a courtroom in Alabama in a death penalty case and expecting that person to defend their own lives against the uh, against all the resources of the state that's trying to kill them and expect them to somehow prevail. And we did used to do that to people um, back in the day. Uh, and people were sentenced to very long prison sentences and to death without the benefit of having an attorney. 
Um, and I used to, before I became uh, an immigration attorney and came to the border, I used to be a federal public defender in Montgomery, Alabama. I've done death penalty appellate litigation. And so I can say with confidence, the systems are pretty similar. You have people that are facing impossible odds uh, and they're literally being sent back to their death because they don't have someone to make those very nuanced legal arguments. It's not because they can't do it. It's just, it would require them to go to law school to do it and they don't have that kind of time. So the success rates are really not revealing of the actual merits of the claim. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I could jump in a little bit too. Um with the, the, the project returns that I mentioned earlier, we actually did an analysis of 10 years of immigration court data, um, which is no small feat because the data is really mismanaged and, and horribly kept. Um, and it's so large that it crashes Excel and you have to use a coding language like R in order to read it. Um, and so that, uh, that was a little bit of a learning curve, but um, we managed to to um, analyze that and we found you know there are there are numerous factors that seem to have an influence on someone's case other than uh what the what the merits of their case are having an attorney what country they are from which which indicates there might be you know some some bias or perception of you know oh well this country is this way or this country is that way um on the part of the judge as opposed to you know what's actually going on there or or you know, we, when you think of, um, for example, um, a country like China gets so um, frequently referred to as like a human rights abuser in, in mainstream media, in, in US government conversations. And so you see a much higher grant rate for people from China than you do from other countries where similar human rights abuses are known and documented to be happening. Um, and then which um, which part of the country your case ends up happening in. So that can that can vary depending on, you know, if you're sent to detention, where was the detention bed space in the moment when you cross the border? Or if you are lucky enough to get released, where was the friend or family member living who agreed to take you in and sponsor you while you wait for your case? Um, because there's different um, case law under, under the different circuit courts that can have a, a pretty large impact in um, the way certain definitions get used in, in going through all the weeds of asylum law to, to make those determinations. Um, and so we saw pretty big disparities depending on which part of the country the case was getting decided in. Um, and then from judge to judge, there are huge, huge gaps in, in grant and denial rates that we saw as well. Um, and as Nicole said, we actually did an analysis of um, reversal rates from the Board of Immigration Appeals and found um, some judges have very high um, reversal rates, so which which would indicate that that it's being found that the judge is not making the right decision, right? So um, there's a lot of factors that can um, that can influence that, and we actually um, created this um, sort of online experience that you can go through where you actually make decisions like, okay, I'm I'm gonna be a person from this country, I'm fleeing it, am I gonna you know, take my child with me or not? Where am I going to try to cross the border? Where, and, and you, you sort of navigate yourself through the system and it shows you in the end which judge you end up with and what their, their grant and denial rates were over that 10 year time period. And so, um, you know, if you have a little time to spend with that, I think it just really illustrates how much the system is stacked against the person who's trying to go through it. Excellent. Thank you very much. We are right on time, but I'd like to um, ask you if you have any other thoughts and um, something to address. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all very much and also our attendees for being here. Uh, it was a pleasure to have this wonderful panel together. And uh, let's stay in touch. I hope to see you all again in other um, you know, circumstances. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all very much. Okay. Bye.